Welcome everyone. I'm Agnes, one of the School and Teacher Program Coordinators at the Natural History Museum. Welcome to another virtual teacher training. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is presented in collaboration with the Los Angeles County Office of Education. So science communication is an essential 21st century skill for our students. But what is it and where should you even start? Today, we will explore the cross-curricular connections of science communication with a panel of accomplished science communicators who each bring their own creative flair to innovating scientific understanding. You will leave hopefully feeling inspired and ready to tap into your students' interests and diverse assets that will help them join the conversation and empower them to see themselves as scientists. This training is also currently being streamed live to YouTube with closed captioning in various languages. For record, the recording of this program and all of our past webinars for teachers and students can be found on our YouTube playlist, which we will drop a link to in the chat. So to start off today, we'd love to know who's joining us. So please go ahead and let us know in the chat. The chat is open. Uh, we'd love to know your name, where you're joining us from, what grade level and subject you teach, or maybe you're a parent at home and you're supporting your child. Um, and then also, please let us know what science communication means to you. So that chat should be open if you want to go ahead and pop that in there. We'd love to know who's joining us in this webinar today. And then thinking a little bit about what science communication might mean to you. All right. Uh, for some reason, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Do we have a shy group of people here today? <laughs> okay, well, maybe you'll all warm up and we'll get back to that um, later. All right, so let's go over what we're gonna do today. So here's what to expect for the next hour that we will be together. We'll wrap up this housekeeping in just a second and then jump right into hearing from our panelists. So after they're finished, we'll have the opportunity to ask any questions that you have, and then we'll share a few related resources. So I see the chat is warming up. Um, hi, Elizabeth, um, and your major is child development, welcome. Um, so we're dropping a link to our educate resource packet in the chat now. There's a space in this document for you to take notes and reflect on critical questions from fellow educators, along with tons of great resources to continue your exploration of SciComm. This packet will also be shared in our follow-up email, but if you wanna go ahead and open it right now while we're doing the webinar, please feel free to, and then we'll share again at the end. So someone from Long Beach. Great, wonderful, welcome everyone. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Agnes um, and I'm joined off screen today by my colleagues in school programs, Jessica and Becca, who will be helping with the chat. Thanks team. And then let's meet our panelists. I know I'm very excited. I'm sure you all are too. So our panelists are gonna hop on right now. We're gonna see their faces. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Leela. Hi, Karina. Um, so, these are our lovely panelists for the day. So we have uh, Leela Higgins, Michelle Barbosa Ramirez, and Karina Domingo. So a little background on each of our panelists today. Leela grew up on a farm in the UK, where it, which is where she learned to love nature. I've seen pictures of that farm. It looks amazing. <laughs> After moving to the US, she pursued degrees in entomology and environmental education. She currently directs the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County's Community Science Program and is the co-founder of the City Nature Challenge and co-author of the book, Wild LA. Michelle is a Latinx Los Angeles native who studies the history of the earth through the stories told in Stone and Bone. They earned a Bachelor of Science in Geology at CSU Fullerton and a Master of Science in Paleontology from the University of Florida and currently splits their time between teaching undergrad geology and co-hosting PBS's Digital Studios Paleontology Show. Michelle also worked at our museum, coordinating the Teen Science Internship Program. Karina is a wildlife biologist from Los Angeles. 
She received her Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Management and Conservation from Humboldt State University. Karina is the founder and director of the Cougar Conservancy. And in 2020, she produced a video series for our museum while serving as a community science program coordinator in the research and collections department. Thank you all for joining us today. So we're gonna start off with Leela. So Leela, if you wouldn't mind starting us off, a thank you. And then the rest of us will see you again in a little bit. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, we'll just wait a second as we get onto the next screen. So I am Leela Higgins. I've been working at the museum for 12 years. So that's a really long time. And uh, as Agnes said, I grew up in England. And so I had not just culture shock when I moved to the US, but I had more nature shock. But my love of nature really translated into my love of science. I studied insects for four years in undergrad and then switched to do a master's in environmental education. And I've been working in SciComm for the past 20 years. I, you can see my career direct trajectory here. It's a little bit uh, abnormal, but you know, what's normal in science and the sciences in the museum field? There is, there is really no normal. So you can see I worked in some labs, working in pure research and science. And then I started working in um, education nonprofits. And it was right here at this point that I realized I was better at talking about science than doing science. So what is science communication? It comes in so many different forms. I got to work on this book called Wild LA. So I wrote a book like that's communicating science about the nature in Los Angeles to Angelinos. I got to work on a garden space, an exhibit at the museum that helps to bring nature to life literally and metaphorically and get people up close and personal to nature in, in LA. I got to work on an exhibit called the Nature Lab which is again, communicating the nature and science of LA, how much biodiversity here and how surprising and wonderful it is. And it's worthy of study, not just for scientists in LA, but for scientists around the world. I also got to do a TED talk and that was 18 minutes long and uh, having to memorize a script for 18 minutes, that, that has, was one of the hardest things I've do ever done in my science communication career but it was really, really powerful in helping me to really refine a story. I also have been writing uh, um, for the museum and also um, a live presenter on KCRW. So I'm a science correspondent for Greater LA and um, got to write a blog for the past 10 years at the museum. And some of the writing I've been able to do, uh, like this story, Everyday Cannibals and Murderers of Los Angeles about the insects that are unknown and weird and a little strange, like the coffin fly. Um, you know, that was able to be in Science uh, Smithsonian Magazine and also got shared in the Washington Post and Discover Magazine. So like it went all over the place. We also work on a lot of uh, activities and kits um, in my office in community science, uh, getting kids outside up close and personal with nature. And so we create things and instructions that are obviously of the written word, communicating to them how to use it. And we'd like to do that in like zine format. And so you can use your art skills there too. And last but not least, obviously social media is one big way. And I really like to incorporate humor um, and I'm really into mushrooms. Again, that weird and wonderful nature that some people don't really know exists here in LA. So one type of interpretation that I wanna talk really quickly about is um, science communication that you get to do up close and personal in the same place as someone else. It's called what we call interpretation. And that's um, these two kids came to the museum and we got to do a night hike around the nature gardens and we got to find creatures with them. So you can see my curly hair there and these kids with that look of wonder and awe on their faces as they're discovering the small thing there. It was a snail, a tiny snail. So this is what we call interpretation. And I am a, a certified interpretive guide through the National Association of Interpretation. And basically just kind of like Spanish language interpretation, I, instead of me translating from English to Spanish, I'm translating 
from the resource, that snail. I am translating the, um, the, the information I know and I'm connecting it to the audience. And I'm not just giving them a bunch of facts, I'm also connecting them to it emotionally as well as intellectually. And the thing I like to say is that, you know, scientists know a lot of facts and we can spout out facts, 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 but people don't remember facts. They really remember stories. So that's a really key point here. I know that we're talking about science communication and all of a sudden I put up a science, uh, uh, like a mathematical equation on the, on the screen. Don't worry, it's really easy to understand what this means. And this is from the National Park Service. It's really helped me in honing my, my skills as a science communication specialist. So KR just means knowledge of the resource. So how much do I know about snails when I was talking to those kids? KA, knowledge of my audience. Who are those kids? How much do I know them? Are they just coming to the museum for the first time? Appropriate technique, talk a little bit about that in a second. And all of that multiplied together equals your interpretive opportunity. So let's dissect this picture. So there's a tiny snail, it's hard to see. I've got my magnifier lenses out there for the kids. This picture was taken right before they used the magnifiers, my flashlight. Um, these are kids that have been in a year long program with the museum. They know a little bit about science. I know them, they know me. So I know where they're coming from. I know how much information I can give them. I know that I don't need to start off with like, what is a snail, but I can maybe talk a little bit about what specific snail species this is that I'm looking at. And the appropriate technique is, was a night hike and like this visceral experience of going around with a flashlight with kids and like hands-on learning experience. Um, they're going to share in the chat with you the, uh, um, a resource from the National Park Service called Handles. And that is an amazing resource that outlines lots of different appropriate techniques that you can use. It's not all about just using words. You can use movement. You can use hands-on demonstrations. You can use humor. You can use dance even. Um, there's so many different ways of doing it. Thanks for the, for the link there. And so last but not least, here's just my top SciComm tips. Um, learn a lot of appropriate techniques. Try them out, test them out. Do them with your kids, do them by yourself. Um, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be a PhD scientist of snails to be able to connect people to snails really well. Make sure you do your research, make sure, make sure you are being factual. Make sure you keep your audience in mind. What's gonna be the most relevant to them? I'm going to speak very differently to a group of a room full of PhD scientists who study snails than I am to a group of, of kids who are six or seven learning about snails, maybe for the first time. Really think about visuals and not just words. We take in so much through our eyeballs and um, they speak pictures, speak a thousand words. We've heard that so many times, but it's so true. Make sure to connect through emotions and not just facts. Storytelling is such a powerful tool. And now, Michelle, over to you. And I am unmuting. So hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. I'm a Latinx LA native, born and raised here in LA County. Um, I'm a paleontologist. I'm an educator. And I'm a science communicator. So a little bit about my background and what actually led me to loving science communication is that I am an accidental scientist. That's what I like to call myself because unlike I think my colleagues here, I did not like science growing up. Um, I actually pretty much hated it. I was really bad at it. Um, it didn't make any sense to me and I couldn't wait to be done with science forever. So when I went to college, you're required to take a science undergrad course. And I thought I'll do geology because rocks are gonna be the easiest science. And jokes on me because as a geologist, I now use physics and chemistry and biology and it's a very interdisciplinary science. But in that class, I found out that science was more than just math equations and beakers and lab coats, science was stuff that I was already doing. So growing here in LA, I'd like to go hiking in the Azusa Canyon. I'd like to go to the beach. And when I was looking at the mountains, I would ask like, why are there mountains here and not in other places? Or why did the trees stop growing at this certain elevation in the mountains and not above it? And all of those questions, all of these things that I was asking was in essence science. And so 
What I love to do with my science communication is teach people that they already are scientists, they're already asking science questions, and that science is in so many things that they already love. So in the next slide, really quickly, I just want to show you my background so you get a feel for what I have done and where I've worked. Um, I've come to SciComm and done SciComm through many different avenues. So I've worked here at the Natural History Museum and other museums around the country. Um, I am a professor. I teach uh, undergraduate geology. And then I also work as a science communicator, um, as a co-host for PBS Eons, doing education at the National Park Service and my baby, Cosplay for Science. So before I tell you about cosplay for science, I wanna show you on the next few slides, my work here at the Natural History Museum. So I worked as the teen internship coordinator with high school students doing, um, essentially teaching students how to be science communicators. These trucks that you see are the mobile museums for the natural history. Essentially they're little museums inside of a converted semi-trailer truck. And normally these trucks would go out with museum employees who would teach people at parks about what they would find inside. With our teen internship programs, we taught those teens how to be the ones that were teaching people. So on our next slide, you can see an example of some of these wonderful teens that got to go out. We gave them the resources, right? We gave them the knowledge. They were the ones that decided how they would teach people at the parks. They were the ones who learned how to be those communicators. So we empowered them and the enthusiasm that they came back with was astounding. On the next slide, you can see in 2020, when we couldn't go in person, we still allowed them to be those science communicators because you don't need to be in person to teach science, right? So what we did was we connected with Nickelodeon and our students love to watch SpongeBob. They're the Marine teens. They decided to create some fun science-based activities using SpongeBob characters. So on this slide and the next slide, you can see these photos and these directions were actually created by our students, right? So they wanted to learn about jellyfish. And so they learned how to do some chemical processes to create their own jellyfish at home. Now this connects really wonderfully to what I do with Cosplay for Science. And in the next slide, you can see our logo and sort of an idea of what we do. We essentially cosplay, so dress up in costumes for the sake of science. On the next slide, you'll see an example of my colleagues who are my co-founders dressed up as Pokemon trainers. And what we do is talk about Pokemon, for example, in this um, pop-up museum that we did at a Comic-Con convention, because there are lots of Pokemon that are inspired by actual real life animals that exist. The process of Pokemon collecting all these pocket monsters was inspired by a bug collector. On the next slide, you can see that there are Pokemon that are inspired by actual real life fossils. And so since my co-founders and I are paleontologists, we would bring out real fossils to teach students about how these things that they already love, so Pokemon, for example, has to do with real science. And again, that brings in the sneaky science that I like to talk about. I was inspired by this by my mom, who's actually an elementary school teacher. And at the end of the day, on certain fun days, her students would say, oh, teacher, teacher, we forgot to do math today, or we forgot to do biology today. And it was just because she was sneakily teaching them how to divide a box of Oreos, right, instead of using just an equation on the board. So if we move on to the next slide, and the next slide after that, you can see more examples of Pokemon and their fossil counterparts. Now, of course, Pokemon isn't the only type of pop culture or science fiction that you could use to talk about science. On the next slide, you'll see an example of our galactic archive, which was when we used Star Wars to talk about geology. So on the next slide, again, you'll see that Tatooine, we compared to the Mojave Desert, right? So the waters of Tatooine, the nature of Tatooine, again, from a geology standpoint, but if you're a biology teacher, on the next slide, you can see an example of us talking about the zoology of Star Wars, right? So once again, if we move on to the next slide, you can see we brought some fossil fish and some ancient, um, some ancient organisms that lived in the seas of what are today um, Middle America. Next slide. Another example, right? If you have older students, perhaps we had a Game of Thrones event um, on the weekend of the season finale of Game of Thrones. And so you can see me there with my Mother of Dinos cosplay instead of Mother of Dragons. We talked about the actual real life um, organisms that lived millions of years ago that inspired dragons or next slide dire wolves which you can actually see at our sister museum the La Brea tar pits because dire wolves were real live animals so again 
things that people already love to learn about, right, that want to know more about how much time do you think your students spend learning about Fortnite, right, or reading about their Pokemon characters, bring in that passion, bring in that excitement, connect it to the scientific process, connect it to science that's already going on, connect it to scientists who love to talk about it. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Karina. Thank you. All right, thanks, Michelle. This is so fun. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a wildlife biologist from Los Angeles, California. Um, after high school, I took a year off and then I decided to go back to school and I enrolled in community college. Um, and then from there, I transferred to Humboldt State University where I got my bachelor's of science in wildlife management and conservation. But throughout the years, I've worked on a lot of really fun SciComm projects with a lot of amazing people and institutions um, in radio, in print, in TV. And I look forward to sharing a little bit more uh, with you today about that. Next slide. Uh, right now, um, currently, I'm the founder and director of the Cougar Conservancy. Our mission is to reduce human wildlife conflict and conserve cougar populations through science-based management and conservation. I'm also, uh, I recently was onboarded as the Urban Wildlife Program Coordinator at the National Wildlife Federation as part of the Save LA Cougars campaign. I've also worked at the Natural History Museum as a community science coordinator with Leela. Um, and I was also the conservation specialist at the Mountain Lion Foundation. When I was up in the Pacific Northwest, I had the opportunity to work on an elk project with the Humboldt State University and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Next slide. So growing up in Los Angeles, you know, I, I definitely didn't come from a generation of birders or naturalists. Um, I'm a first generation college student from a low income background. And I was sort of a wild child, you know, you could catch me skating around the neighborhood with no parental supervision. And the only wildlife I really ever remember seeing or interacting with was the snails that I would find on the concrete. But my family never talked to me about college or any career pathways growing up. We really struggled with a lot of our basic needs. And I'm not sure in all honesty, if they have ever even thought that college uh, may be an option for me. Next slide. Um, however, you know, I really loved animals and I loved science. And so I would spend hours watching Steve Irwin and I would reenact his attempts to catch crocodiles um, on home movies. But, you know, sitting in my house as a kid, Steve transported me to these different places and introduced me to these incredible animals. And little did I know then, you know, he would inspire me to communicate to the public on behalf of wildlife too. Uh, next slide. Um, another major influence on me, you know, was Bill Nye. So whenever that teacher rolled out that TV uh, to play an episode of his show, I was always stoked. Uh, next slide. Uh, but, you know, this is what people typically think of when they think of a wildlife biologist, right? Somebody out there in the field handling wildlife. But actually, my job now is really about working with people and with communities and helping them coexist with wildlife. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, Leela gave her formula. I'm going to give my formula for SciComm. Uh, your methods may look different than ours, and that is totally okay too. So one, I start off by asking myself, what is the problem of interest? What am I trying to address? And is it really a problem? And if so, you know, why is it important that I address it? Based on the problem, I then identify a target audience based on some goals and objectives. I research where my audience works and plays, both in the virtual and the real world. From there, I plan and execute, whether it's a video, a blog, a podcast, or a timeline, um, I go out and I, and I do it. And then afterwards, I look at some outcomes um, and results and compare them to my original goals and objectives. You know, did I get the results that I hoped for? Uh, so I th then do a debrief. And then I adapt and improve, and, and improve for next time. And I keep on doing that. I never strive uh, to be perfect. And like Leela said, you shouldn't either. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, but it should be said that during a SciComm workshop that science isn't always enough, right? So despite thousands of scientific studies and papers on the incredible animals that inhabit our planet, species continue to vanish every single day. And so as part of my SciComm, I also tried to make the democratic process of policy engagement more accessible to audiences as well. And so for this, our team created an interactive timeline that walks you through the process of listing a species for protection in California. And you can explore that on, on our website. Um, we're taking it a step further this year and we're gonna be creating a video series on how to engage um, with wildlife agencies, regardless of the city you live in, your profession, your citizenship, um, and so on. And so what I would say to educators like you all is that intersectionality in SciComm is highly encouraged. You know, whether you have a student who's really interested in art and conservation or art and policy, um, I definitely encourage you guys to nurture that. Next slide, please. Um, and that's a great segue to this slide. Um, this was a graphic on coexisting with cougars that we just developed. So I worked with Lee Douglas on our team and they created this beautiful infographic to show how trimming hedges two to three feet off the ground around your home can help you reduce negative interactions with cougars and other native wildlife we all value. Next slide, please. Um, so when you and your students are thinking about the various SciComm mediums and platforms of which, you know, there are so many out there these days, you know, just ask yourself, where does your target audience, you know, hang out, both virtually and in the real world? And so our team recently decided to launch a TikTok account uh, for two reasons. Many TikTok uh, users are not active on any other platform. And we wanted to reach younger audiences and bring them into this conservation journey with us. And so the first video we posted was a short video on the story of Monrovia. This was a local cougar that we rescued recently with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife after she was badly burned after a wildfire. And so the song coupled with images and video of us actually working in the field really captured the hearts and minds of a lot of people a half a million people. Uh, so let's just say we instantly went viral when this uh, when this happened. We gained 15,000 followers pretty much overnight. But what was really exciting was the engagement. The e engagement from the audience was extraordinary. And we really wanted to reciprocate and start a conversation. So we really took the time to reply to many questions and all of the, um, the messages that we got from the community. And so essentially, um, I and the Cougar Conservancy, we use science communication as a tool to enhance human cougar relationships, to increase tolerance of predators, and also connect people with wildlife and the conservation action they can take to ensure their survival in perpetuity for all Angelinos, for all Californians. And that's my spiel. Thank you. And that was a great spiel. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite all of our panelists back onto camera um, before we jump into our question and answer session. Um, so thank you all. Uh, that was amazing. That was great. That was a great presentation. I think what's really interesting is all the different paths that lead to where you are today. There's not one typical path if you want to be a scientist, right? You're all scientists, but there's not one typical path. And I think that's what's amazing. And that's what's what's great to let students know that there's a million different ways to get to where you are. You all clearly have a passion for what you're doing. I think it starts with that. And then you find your way to get to where you are. And then how each of you communicate science in different platforms in different ways. You're all doing the same thing, but you're all doing it so differently, which I think is really fabulous as well. Um, so let's jump into, our, and thank you again, let's jump into a question and answer session. Um, we're going to attempt to get through as many questions as possible. Um, so go ahead and put your questions, um, or audience, put your questions in the chat box if you haven't already. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now so that you can see all of us better. Uh, let's do that. And then we'll jump up. Okay, great. So let's get to some of our questions. Um, oh, and they're all coming in. So question that I did see that I thought was great um, from Kelly, for all of you, and I'm going to throw it out to all of you. What is a good working definitions, definition of science communication? 
there there are a lot out there and like literally there there are folks who study the science of science communication and how well it works um but like i'm not gonna be able to trot out like a definition that's like a exact one but for me it's really about like that act of um and the practice of how we educate or inform or raise awareness about um science related issues and you know in the museum a lot of it is about like how are we translating the scientific research that our scientists do to the general public um but then we also have a lot of programs where we um communicate just like the natural history of la so like what's going on with nature in los angeles and we communicate that and like what species there are and um how they live and where they live and how they interact with each other um so i think there's there's multiple definitions i'd love to hear if karina or michelle have something else i think yeah that's great. I, oh go ahead karina Oh, no, I was just going to say, I agree with Leela. There's so many definitions of what SciComm is. And also it's going to be dependent on like how you do SciComm and, and what SciComm means to you and kind of how you approach it based on your background and your experience. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of overlap with science education and science communication. Um, and as a science communicator, I think I'm a better educator and vice versa. But I think the key difference for me is SciComm is about bringing awareness. So for me, the reason I love SciComm is, again, there's things that you probably enjoy or do that are really related to science or that knowledge of science would benefit you. It's not that I'm trying to make you a scientist or that you need to go through a 16 week course with me, but in five minutes, I can probably give you some really cool knowledge that might get you excited to learn about something a little bit later, right? Um, that's yeah. So SciComm is a little bit different for everyone, but it's at its core, it's being aware of just all the cool science that's available to you. Yeah, there's a lot out there that's very cool. And jumping kind of off in that off of that. So a teacher, if you're a teacher, where do you start? Like, where do you start? How can you show your students um, cool science projects and lessons, but without spending a lot of money? So without having a lot of materials? Again, I'll just throw it out to all of you whoever wants to jump in? I can start off by talking. So I'm an educator and I teach um, undergrad, but a lot of my projects I think can be translated very easily to high school and middle school students. So I'm all of a sudden teaching online, like all of you guys are, and I teach lab classes. And so I've had to, got, I've had to get really creative about how I'm teaching. And what I decided was, for example, instead of doing exams, um, where they're having to do a bunch of multiple choice questions online, which is boring for them and boring for me. What my students have to do in my paleontology class is they pick 25 events in earth history and they have to tell me about it. And the only rule is that it cannot be an essay. So I've had students, and actually if we can share slides, I believe this is slide number 32. So I've had one student that they were a graphic design artist and they wrote an entire comic book about all the events in earth history. Another student turned those events into a children's book. Another student wrote some songs, right? And so I gave them the definition of you have to show me sources, right? Like you have to cite sources and you have to actually give me, you know, a, a full sentence for each one. But here's an example, right? This is what these students did. If I had just assigned an essay they would have been bored out of their minds. But because I let my students play to their strengths or play to what they were interested in, right? I've got in infographics, I've got in these um, graphic novels. Another student was a um, journalism major. So they wrote like newspaper articles and newspaper headings, right? So because it was something that my students were already really excited about, paired with the science that they were learning, just the enthusiasm and the things that I get back from them is so much more exciting. And you don't need any materials to do this, right? They they could just do this all completely online. Um, what I like to do is I link in, for example, Canva is a good example of how you can use um, graphic design online. There's a lot of websites that let you just plug in text to a graphic novel so you can create graphic novels with students. There's a lot of resources out there that are free but even if you don't have those, I mean, your students can draw on a piece of paper and that works just fine. So by no means do I think you need to have 
any special materials or any special resources. If anything, and I think we'll be sharing more of this later on in the workshop, connect with some science communicators, see what they're already doing, and just turn that into an assignment. Uh, I think it can be done pretty easily. A lot of what we do as science communicators is we wanna get information to you in a quick manner and in a really engaging manner. And if you can do that as a, as a teacher, like I know how to do a five minute elevator pitch for the history of the world and how it started as a molten ball of magma, right? I've already hooked you in. So yeah, science communication can be created into some really wonderful um, assignments that don't take that much work on your end. Wow, that's fabulous. Do you wanna follow that, Leela? Sure, yeah, we do a lot of programs, again, about nature in LA or in your backyard. And as we're all working from home and schooling from home, um, even if you don't have a backyard, there's still nature around your house, around the place that you live. Um, sometimes even in your house, I was able to find some small creatures living in the corners of my mom's house where I'm living right now. Um, and there's a great app that's free on, on phones uh, called iNaturalist. And there's also a version called Seek, which is great for younger audiences. So depending on what age group you are teachers of, um, you can literally take a picture of um, something in your backyard, a plant, an animal, a mushroom, and the app will help you to identify it. And then it will also connect you to information about it. So you can then say, make up an, a program or activity where go find something in your backyard that lives around you. So there's already some like sort of relevancy there. Like this is something that's in my own space, the place that I live and then learn about it by using the app, you can help to identify it and then share back what you find with the, with the group. And that might be an interesting way to, to, to do something. And I know that the school and teacher programs um, group are working with a teacher who is writing some iNaturalist curriculum right now. And um, we're paying them because we do a lot of by teachers for teachers um, because obviously you teachers know how to write curriculum better than we museum educators do. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to share that with you soon. That would be really exciting. Something I'd like to chime in and say also is I like to ask my students to be science communicators. Um, so I'll give them a prompt that says, you know, your family knows that you're taking Geology 101 and when quarantine is over, they want you to take them on a road trip and tell them all about the geology of whatever is near our home, right? The Mojave Desert, for example. And so they have to be able to be a geology tour guide and explain all of that information to their family. And I know if they can explain it at that level, then they've understood, right? Again, I'm teaching at an undergraduate level, but this is still applicable throughout K-12. So asking them again to be that teacher or to be the educator, I feel is really empowering and gets them really excited. And Michelle, just off of that too, because you are more of a classroom educator right now, um, as all of our educators probably know, and, and we do on a daily basis when we teach on Zoom, um, a lot of students are camera shy. They don't want to engage. You're looking at a black screen, right? You're just looking at that little square with maybe a name or a picture on it. So how do you get those students to participate and engage in conversation? And if any of our educators out there have ideas with that too, and you want to put that in the chat, because I think now in this world that we're living in is kind of a struggle when you're face to face with students, it's so much easier but when you're behind a computer screen. So if you have any advice on that, Michelle, or anyone, yeah. actually, if you want to jump in. Yeah, so it varies definitely class by class. But what I like to do is first I make use of the chat because they're a lot less shy using chat and using text. So if that's how I'm talking to them, it's just with a text box, that's fine because we can talk and we get some really good conversations going. But the other thing I like to do is I'm very silly on camera. So we'll stop and we'll do stretching breaks like every 30 minutes, right? We'll do silly things that have nothing to do with geology or science class or talk about Netflix. And once they're getting comfortable about that, sometimes they'll turn on their video because they wanna show, I don't know, whatever we're talking about. And from there, they start to get less shy. Um, so, you know, get silly. It, it doesn't all have to be about learning science the entire time, you know, connecting with my students lets me then later connect with them, you know, they'll send me an email about I found this rock on my walk and how do I identify it or it, it'll come back, it'll come back around. Go ahead, Karina. Go ahead. I, 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 saw you 
Uh, one resource I um, I learned actually from Leela when I was working at the museum was a jam board. So that's something that I've been integrating in our internal meetings, just internally to brainstorm and kind of talk about what people's interests are. And so a jam board is awesome because you can make it anonymous. And so you can ask your students to, you know, answer a question that you guys are posing um, without them having to feel like, oh, what if I get it wrong? My name's in the chat. And so Jamboard's a, an anonymous way to kind of get, get the, the wheels turning. Um, bouncing off what Michelle and Karina both said, love both of those ideas. Being silly and like modeling silliness, that is something I do in my in-person programs. I'm always like, okay, let's pretend to be a stick insect and you're blowing in the wind now. And it'd be better if you could see more of my body than just my face. Um, and then we actually played a game with a bunch of our uh, museum educators the other day. And I was like, I am so over Zoom. I am sick of it. And I want to have my screen off too. So I get that kids are like, I want to, I, I don't want to have my screen on. And I'm a very extroverted person. So like, I'm cool with the screen on, not because of like being introverted, but because I'm just zoom burnout digital burnout we're all feeling that the students must be feeling that to so to such a big extent but we played a game and it was so fun and we we're running around our house and you had to show what you had found like go find something living and you know i came back with the grapefruit there's a ball of grapefruit right here so i wasn't prepared for this uh go find something that's that used to be alive and you know we all ran around trying to find things and so those kinds of games, again, it's also active and it's movement and you're like moving around the house. Um, and I think that those are just ways that like help with the breaking up the monotony that is living this life and trying to teach and learn in this virtual environment. Yeah, and I think that's that's great too, especially for younger kids, right? Because we're not all, Michelle, I know you have undergrads and, and this is all adults here, but there's kindergartners and first graders and second graders who we want to get interested in science. And I think all those are great ideas of moving around and taking a break. And just because we're on a computer, we're, we're not robots, right? And I think it's okay if you mess up a little bit or, you know, or, or just be human, I think, when you don't have that human interaction. So those are all, those are all great ideas. Thank you. Um, and then how can we measure progress and give feedback to large groups of students as they practice the scientific communication? Like, how can we do that now again, virtually, but are there ways that, that you can do that and how you gauge how engaged your students are? Just throwing it out to the group. So the nice thing about iNaturalist and I'm not, I don't work for iNaturalist. It's just a free platform that we use a lot of you could set up a project and then each student um, could use the app and then you could track how many observations they make that way. So that that would be one thing that could be that just like literally came out came into my head. But yeah, so I, I mentioned that I have my students do theoretical assignments where they have to explain to their family. Sometimes I make them actually go talk to their family and see if their family understood what they're saying, right? So if their family didn't get it, then they have to come back and they have to edit that assignment. Um, so yeah, just have them go through the whole practice. It, really the rest of my um, measuring their progress is very similar to how we would do it with any traditional assignment. Um, they're still gonna turn in the work at the end. We can still measure that progress the same way. I feel what's changed is the engagement and the, the excitement levels more than anything. Thank you. Um, so when we're doing this, we're imparting the scientific knowledge, right? We're communicating science to these students. Um, how can we show students how they can put that into a practical kind of environment? Like what can they do with that knowledge and, and where can you lead them? So I've told you this and here's science communication. So now what? I can kick us off there. Um, that's how I approach, you know, I approach a lot of our issues with wildlife conservation and our environmental woes. Um, I think about things like, you know, what am, what am I passionate about? Whether it's, you know, um, plastic that I saw at the beach 
Um, and so getting people, getting kids interested in stuff, uh, interested in science communication, um, from where they're at, what are their interests and, and then going, and then going off from there, I think is a, is a really good point to try and intersect the SciComm with what you're doing also in the classroom. And, and so identifying the problem of interest that they're interested in investigating will be really helpful in them really going forward um, with the SciComm project, whether it's a video or you know a, um, um, a podcast or something like that. And I think um, like when they've done studies on like nature education for kids and um, I think sometimes like we would, I remember learning about like the rainforest when I grew up in the UK, but they, and I was like seven or something, but they've done research and found that kids need to know about the nature in their own backyards first before they start learning about that, what's happening in the rainforest far, far away. Um, because again, it has that sense of relevance. So like, what are the scientific topics and issues in your own neighborhood, in the, in the student's neighborhood? Are there like, um, amazing creatures that we didn't know existed in your own backyard? Are there some rare or endangered species in your own backyard? Are there environmental justice issues happening in your area? Obviously that would skew to an older um, student audience um, to work on something like that. And, and I have a background, my master's is in environmental education. So it was really about like, what are the issues that we're facing? And then what are the skills that we need to, 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 to gather and the motivation to solve those problems. And so like, I can imagine students sharing what are the environmental justice issues in my neighborhood? And then how, what are some solution, potential solutions that they could come up with and present? Um, and I can imagine that being like a group learning project and uh, that could be really interesting. Like if they're Zoom breakout rooms, again, as a non-formal non education teacher, I only work with kids a small amount of every week. So you all know best on how that would work. I think what you said though, Leela, is, is really like with kids learning about in their own backyard first, I think it's super important. Um, and as you mentioned, INAT is great. Um, not everybody has a Leela on their speed dial on their phone like me. Um, I know you said, Michelle, like get a bigger science community. Like I, I, I emailed Leela and texted Leela, what is this bug in my backyard? What is this thing? What is this wasp? Like, what, what is this? And you've always gotten back to me, which I share with my kids and neighborhood kids of like, here's something that's in our backyard. So I think that's great. And I'm so glad you haven't blocked me yet. I don't, I don't bug you that, that often, right? No, not too bad. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle, you're going to say something. Oh, just jumping off of that, when I had our marine science teams, right, when we first had started going everything online, one of the things that we really loved to do was, as our break, while we were on Zoom together, we would all go outside onto our balconies, our backyard, whatever it was, and use INAT. But INAT isn't the only science, citizen science project that's out there. Like, maybe your student isn't into nature. Maybe they really love space. There are citizen science projects where you can like count stars or there are other citizen science projects where they're built like a game where you're like trying to connect different molecules together. I don't even, there's just so many, so many different kinds. So if you're thinking like, wow, I know all my kids have different interests. How am I gonna create a new lesson plan for every single kid? Have every kid find a citizen science project they're interested in. Or maybe they want to keep learning and you're moving on to the next lesson. There are communities built out there for them already. And there are citizen science projects that are geared towards older and younger students or all ages. So if you go to like SciStarter or even citizenscience.gov, there's just so many collections of anything you could be interested in. One of the things that I used to love to talk to students about was you know, again, you're in my class because you have to be, right? Maybe you don't like science and that's okay. But I would tell them, tell me something you're interested in and I'll tell you how it connects to science. So, oh, you like music? They're sound engineers, right? There's actual engineering that has to go into it and this is how it connects, right? So you can even make that into a game. You can make that an assignment. How is something that you love that's not connected to science actually super connected? And then jump off of that into a citizen science project. The resources are out there for you. Yeah, no, great point. Um, so kind of coming off of that, like everybody has different interests, as I'm sure you all have your thing that you love. So what is, for each of you, what is your favorite thing for students to work on? 
What do you love doing with them the most? I love doing um, nature memory maps uh, for younger kids or for older kids or like even adult scientists, um, like play memory maps, memories of where and how they played as a kid. Um, and I've done that with people from all over the world in all different walks of life. Um, but specifically with, with youth, I've done nature memory maps. And if you ever get a chance one day when the museum reopens, you can come back to the nature lab. You can see some of the nature memory maps that are on display there. And there was one that I did a, with a group of 17 students from um, Leo Politi Elementary School, and they shared their memories of what they found in their small garden space. And they had really rich stories of like, one day we saw a pigeon getting eaten by a hawk. And one day a hummingbird came into our classroom. And then one day there was this spider that built its web on the monkey flower. This is their own words, their own um, knowledge of these species. And then I went back the next day and the spider web was gone. And we collated all of those memories and those drawings and like their literal faces into illustration format. So they're on the map in that space. Um, and we have a resource, I think, for how to make play memory maps or nature memory maps um, and how to lead that as an activity. And then you're incorporating memories of nature, the natural history of those species, and uh, also art skills and writing skills at the same time. So for me, you know, we're still developing our youth programs. And so Cougar Conservancy was launched in April of 2020. So we've only been around 11 months and we hope to get our youth programs up and going. Um, but something that I've done in the past with students is a touch table. Um, so I found that actually getting them out of their seats during or in the in between the talk or after the talk, getting them out of their seats and actually up on the table to sort of touch the pelt of a mountain lion. You know, ooh, I didn't know its hair would be so soft. Um, you know, we have scat on the table as well. Everyone loves to talk about poop. I don't care if you're a kid or an adult, Every, everyone likes scat, okay? Um, and also them being able to see the skull and the teeth and, and to think critically about, um, you know, all of the different parts that they're touching. And from that, I think Leela just touched on it too, from this interaction, we're hearing stories from students. And so, um, you know, when I was up in Humble, you know, people tend to see cats up there. Um, and I'd hear stories about, oh, me and my dad were out and we saw a mountain lion once and it had a really long tail, but I didn't know it was this soft. And so um, anyways, I think incorporating um, that, not just mountain lion stuff, but also their prey um, and the other animals that benefit from mountain lions being on the landscape is also a way to, to kind of bring in more visuals, more, more um, tactile and sounds too. So at the, at the touch table, it doesn't all have to be touching. You can also play um, some of the audio for mountain lions, which is very fun because they have really cool vocalizations. I mean, as a paleontologist, my favorite thing is showing fossils to people. It's so exciting, especially when they realize that it's a real fossil, right? This is something that was in the ground and alive millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. And I understand not everyone has fossils. And even here in LA, I have less opportunities, right? When I did grad school in Florida, you could walk into your creek, like right in the middle of town and find fossils. Here, everything's paved over. But that doesn't mean you can't find fossils. And that doesn't mean you need to find a specific fossil to understand how cool an area is. So you can download um, apps like Rocked, for example, on iPhone, where it tells you that, you know, this is the age of this mountain that you're walking on, right? And so now my students know, oh, this mountain was being you know, created or solidified when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth, right? So I don't need to have an actual dinosaur fossil for them to start connecting, oh, wow, like this is so old and like a T-Rex could have walked right over it. You know, so you're still making all of these connections that again, I think will get them very excited and hopefully we'll get them talking to their friends. As I tell them, I hope your friends get as annoyed of about everything you're learning as my friends are annoyed of listening to all the birds and like dinosaur facts I give them. That's my goal. I love that. If they're annoying the friends, that means they're communicating science to them, right? Which is the goal of everything. So I love that. It's great. Um, so we touched on this a little bit. Karina, you touched on it in your um, presentation with social media, but trying to make science accessible to all students, thinking about maybe some media outlets 
um, that students can relate to right now, like maybe teenagers or older kids, if you have anything that you comes to the top of mind? Yeah, there's so many. There's so many social medias now and ways to interact and do SciComm. Um, one big thing that I touched on a little bit during my talk uh, is TikTok. So you, if you haven't explored TikTok yet, it's really interesting because there is a hashtag learn on TikTok and you can go there and who is there? Bill Nye is there, but also there's, um, you know, a wide variety of different disciplines and people in the field who are doing SciComm on that. And so I really get inspired by seeing what other people are up to. Um, and I'm just like scraping the surface on TikTok. So that would be one thing to consider if you're considering um, uh, younger audiences. Great, thank you, Karina. Um, and I know we're kind of running out of time, but I do have a couple more questions I do want to ask. And educators, if you have to leave at five o'clock, please feel free to, you'll get a recording of this. Um, but there's a couple more questions I do want to ask because this is all great and you guys are amazing. Um, how can we make science and science communication culturally responsive? This is something that my staff and I talk a lot about. Um, and, you know, how do we uplift BIPOC um, voices in science and science communication? Um, and I think representation obviously really matters. Um, Miguel in our office grew up in LA. He is, um, of Nicaraguan descent, but grew up in LA. And so when he goes into schools and interacts with kids that look like him, that's a whole different thing than me going into school uh, as a white woman and interacting with kids who are black or brown. And they see that as then an option for them to be able to go along and have a career in science maybe, that they maybe wouldn't if I went there and did that. Um, I think also uplifting traditional ecolog ecological knowledge um, from native folks and indigenous folks. I think that that is um, a lot of science has been very upholding of white supremacy culture. And so I think with older kids, obviously we could talk about like, how has that happened? Um, there's some really interesting um, zines about this. Uh, one of them I can, I can find the link and share about like who benefits from science and who's, who's who's got the power in science, um, something to talk about with high school students maybe. But I think that representation piece, uplifting BIPOC voices, uplifting traditional ecological knowledge are some of the things I can, I would say straight off the bat. Yes, that is exactly what I was going to talk about with um, traditional knowledge, being respectful of it and validating it. It's all, <laughs> it's science, it's science, we just don't call it that. I'd also suggest when you are showing science role models or science superheroes, if you just Google like woman in science or whatever, you'll get the same three or five names over and over and they're all white women. Um, there are lots of women of other color or people of other color, um, queer scientists, so many people that um, are alive today that you could talk to or that are you know, historical scientists, but that come from different cultures. So take the time to do a little bit more research um, and use a more diverse role models for your students. Um, because not only will the more diverse role models be inspiring in terms of someone that looks like me, but they'll have thought about science in a more inclusive way as well. Yeah, I, I love all of that, you guys. Um, something I guess I can add is, you know, um, as we're developing more programs at Cougar Conservancy, we're also trying to just in general decenter whiteness. Um, so we're really trying to have more programs that um, are in Spanish and um, not assuming, you know, this, this, you know, white as it, as like the standard culture and English being kind of the standard thing that, that we use. And so what I would say is as you start your SciComm journey with your students, you know, be really careful not to use, you know, erasure language. Um, a lot of SciCommers now, they're still 
they're still using this erasure language when they're talking about indigenous peoples. They're saying, you know, they were on the landscape and it's like, no, they are on the landscape. And so being mindful uh, of that as you're starting this work is I think really integral. And um, um, just kind of adding to Leela and Michelle, you know, there are so many awesome hashtags online where you can learn from people who are doing SciComm from these different cultures and communities. You can hear it right from the horse's mouth. Um, so I encourage you to, to explore a lot of these awesome hashtags, um, I think, uh, and, and channels like BirdAbility and all of these, um, these uh, social media platforms that kind of already have the people there. They're already there doing the stuff. So go follow them and go support them and see what they're up to. Wonderful answers, thank you. Okay, last question, I promise. Last question, it's a big one. Why is science communication important? What is the so what? Why do we care? Why is it important? Right, we ask that in education all the time. What is the so what factor? I can start. Um, so I, I mentioned this earlier, but my goal is not to turn everyone into a scientist, right? I'm not hoping that every student that comes through my class is changed forever in terms of wanting to become a scientist. But I do hope they are changed forever in terms of feeling empowered to ask questions, um, to think more critically, right? If we just had everyone in my class becoming scientists, that wouldn't be so useful. But maybe those students are business majors or they're gonna become lawyers or wherever branch, whatever route they're taking, they're gonna be a lawyer that knows a little bit more about science and maybe wants to bird watch on the weekend. Or they're gonna be a CEO that also understands why maybe they should be more sustainable in their practices, right? So SciComm to me is important because I wanna reach everyone, not just scientists. And I want everyone to A, care, but B, be empowered to continue to ask those questions and be a scientist in their own personal life. Um, that's, that's why SciComm matters. I think SciComm matters because we live on Earth and science happens on Earth. We need to understand the world around us. Okay, not everyone needs to know exactly how snails mate. That's cool. I like that information. Or how slugs, you know, um, are hermaphrodites. Not everyone needs to know that. But we need to know about how our planet functions for us to survive on this planet and for us to keep ourselves humans on this planet into the future um so like to me it's about like the survival of our human race and um if we don't know about science we don't we aren't able to understand science or we aren't able to um uh make informed decisions about science then then what's going to happen like who's going to be making the decisions people who are uninformed about science and then we get into maybe trouble I'll just end on that bit. I couldn't help but smile just listening to your why SciComm matters to you guys. Because uh, I mean, I I agree. Um, you know, to all of to all of that, which is why I was smiling so hard. Um, for me, yeah. I mean, it comes back around to you know, there's the science, and then there's what do we do with the science? You know, how can we make our planet better for both people? Um, and for human communities um, so that we can all live in, in better harmony uh, with one another. So I guess that's the only thing I have to add to all of that. That was great though. And this has been so fun. Thank you all. I think that's a great way to end it. This has been amazing. I'm not a scientist, but I get to work with amazing, fabulous women like yourselves who are scientists and who are so great at communicating that. And one of the reasons that I do love my job, as you mentioned, Michelle, like if you have this, this group of people that you are exposed to and you're also passionate about what you do. So thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, this was great. I want to do it again in person, in the museum, right? Where we can watch Leela be a stick bug or whatever you said, Leela, right? Um, in person, like, and I want Michelle to dress up in her cosplay. And Karina, can you bring a cougar? In? I don't know. Is that a lie? Maybe not. We can use your guys' pelts. Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous. So thank you all again. I appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen again as we just wrap everything up. And I will see you all soon. All right.
So thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them. Um, I tried to get through all of them, but everybody has so much fabulous things to say, and we did run a little over. Um, so I want to share some of the resources discussed by our guests that we have gathered to support your continued exploration of this topic. And don't worry, we're going to drop all these links into the chat in just a moment, and you'll also get them in an email after the training. Um, so there are so many resources now available, as you heard from our panelists, um, but it can be overwhelming. So here are a few free resources that we offer through our museum. Um, we do live museum presentations. Um, so you can meet our scientists in this webinar style program similar to this. You'll hear from one of our research and collection staff and then participate in a Q&A about their career path through science. And it's a live virtual presentation. And we do a different scientist every week. Um, and then for Skype scientists, our research and collection staff are partnering with this organization, which is a nonprofit organization connecting scientists with people all over the world to schedule virtual Q&A in a sessions with community members and classrooms. You can even select a scientist to speak with your class that self identifies with the particular affinity group. And then at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum, we're super excited about this. We're offering a three part series in April in collaboration with the Yukon Beringia Center. Um, this series will be a live webinar style program and is for students. So we're excited about this um, to partner with our friends in Canada to bring an international perspective of the Pleistocene. So those uh, resources will have been put in the chat for you. And again, you're going to get these in an email packet in the follow up email. Um, and then there's also a recording of this webinar and links to the resources referenced in this workshop. And you'll also receive a certificate of completion for participating in today's webinar. So our next event is going to be in a couple of weeks. Please be sure to sign up for our teacher email list to be the first to know about these new resources and upcoming events. And for more information on all of our online distance learning resources, check out our website, nhm.org. So thank you all again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And we hope to see you all in person at the museum soon. Take care.